2 Kings Part 2, uh, Bible Study Lecture Number 9 in this series. Uh, in the last lecture we had seen Elijah perform many miracles because God has blessed him. He took uh, salt and cast it into the waters and made them where they were not bitter so that there would be abundance. And who is our living water? It is, of course, Christ. He had raised a young man from the dead, which Christ had the power to do, to deliver from death. And not only this, he had um, taken poisoned food. In other words, uh, some of the servants went out and gathered of a wild vine gourds. Wild vine is, of course, symbolic in many places of the Kenite or of false doctrine. And as it was set before the people, they began to eat it, and uh, they knew it was poison, and they said, there is death in the food. And Elijah took meal, which is symbolic of the bread, the flour, in other words, the wheat, which is... Um, symbolic in a lot of places of the Bible, of the children of promise, but uh, the bread of life is what it's really referring to, the unleavened bread, the truth, the true doctrine. And he cast it into the pot, and it made the food where it was no longer poison, and they were able to eat of it. Uh, just in passing, before we get this lecture started, I noticed today... Uh, from a day or so ago when uh, our esteemed president was over in um, Israel visiting with the president of Israel, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, that on the podiums that they both stood at, there, were, there was a symbology. There was, of course, the menorah, which is, you know, we've covered what the menorah is in the previous books of the Bible. It is symbolic of the um, six lights with the well in the middle, making the seventh. Uh, the well, of course, symbolic of uh, that which holds the oil or which holds the truth. And it, of course, is symbolic of um, God or Christ, the truth, and the well of oil which delivers oil to the lights that they may may dispel the darkness. A lot of people say, well, there's six on it, and six is an evil number. Well, six is not always an evil number. I mean, th there are cases, and the, the argument could be made that, yes, six does mean sinfulness or the exceeding sinfulness of man and is one of the numbers associated with Satan. But with the oil in the middle, there are seven stems on this menorah. But anyway, that's neither here nor there to what I'm talking about. The thing that I noticed on the podiums was that there was a stalk of wheat going up from either side on either side of the menorah. Well, what was the parable of the, ter uh, the tares in the wheat? And what did Christ explain to us about the tares in the wheat? The tares were the children of promise. The children of the kingdom. In other words, true Judah. But they looked just like the wheat and were indistinguishable from each other until they produced fruit. In other words, the wheat produced free, uh, the, the uh, well, it produced the wheat. Uh, I'm not sure what you would call it. The fruit of the wheat, like, the, like corn produces um, its fruit. But it produces that which is sustenance to the body, whereas the tares produce poison. And on the symbology of these podiums that these two men stood at, you had these two things which look like wheat going up on either side of the menorah. I feel that they are very symbolic of the parable of the tares and the wheat, which look identical to each other, but one is poison and one is fruitful. 
In other words, one is sustenance and one is poison. And uh, one is symbolic of the Kenites and one is symbolic of the children of Israel, the true children of Israel, the true Jew. In other words, and not the Jews which call themselves Jews but are the synagogue of Satan mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And I wanted to mention that in going along with this uh, poison in the pot which was made clean and uh, because it came of the wild vine, the gourds of the wild vine. Uh, we know who our true vine is. It is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the grapes thereof are symbolic of his blood, which is why we make wine from the grape of the vine, which is symbolic because we take communion with the wine and with the bread. So I just wanted to mention that in passing before we get going here in Second Kings chapter 5. So before we start Second Kings chapter 5 verse 1, let us go to our Father in prayer and ask for guidance and wisdom as we study this, his most holy and precious word, his letter to us. Heavenly Father, we come before you this day, and we ask, Father, that you open our eyes and ears to the truth, that you give us eyes to see, Father, and that you unplug our ears from the doctrines of men and from the poison which has fallen into them. That you clear them out and make them so that only your truth can enter. We ask also that you bless the eyes and ears of all who study with us, Father, and that your hand always be upon these studies. For we know assuredly that from time to times you are God, our Father who brought our forefathers out of the land of Egypt, out of oppression, who performed miracles and showed your mighty hand before them, and who has been with this people and even given us a Savior and a path to salvation because you love and care for us in a way that we cannot even understand. And we ask these things of you, Father, faithfully, not, nothing wavering, in the name of our Lord and Savior, whom you gave us, Yahshua HaMashiach, Jesus the true Christ. Amen. So, Second Kings, I don't know why I keep wanting to say Ching here. Second uh, Kings, chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. And he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. Verse 2. And the Syrians had gone out by companies, and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. Verse 3. And she said unto her mistress, would God, my Lord, were the prophet that is in Samaria, were with the prophet that is in Samaria. In other words, you've got God and Lord in the same sentence, and usually when that happens, they mean the same thing. But you've got God in uppercase G and Lord in lowercase. So she was saying, what this really says is, would to God, in other words, my God of Israel, that my Lord, in other words, my master Naaman, were with the prophet, in other words, Elisha, in Samaria, in other words, in Israel, in the ten tribes. For he would recover him from his leprosy. And it wouldn't naturally be Elijah that would do it necessarily. It would be the power of God through Elijah. Or Elisha, excuse me. And, um, well, anyway, verse 4. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. Verse 5. In other words, he told her what she'd said. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. As he departed, he took with him ten talents of silver, and six thousand pieces of gold, and ten changes of raiment. Verse 6. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, 
Now when this letter come unto thee, behold, I know therewith that Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him from his leprosy. Verse 7. And it came to pass when the king of Israel read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man does send to me to recover a le man of leprosy? Wherefore consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh to a quarrel against me. In other words, he thinks he's trying to uh, get something started with him. In other words, he, he, he thinks that uh, Naaman is being sent by the king to him to heal. And he knew he couldn't heal him. And uh, he's thinking, well, if he sends him to me and I don't heal him, then he's going to want to start a war against me. Which was not what Naaman was being sent for. Naaman was being sent to Elijah. Verse 8. And it was so when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had written his clothes. Again, this is a symbology of lamentation or rage or a number of reasons. That he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. In other words, he's going to know that there's a man of God in Israel. Verse 9. So Naaman came to the door, or came with his horses, and with his chariot, and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. Verse 10. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. In other words, you're going to be healed. And of course, seven here, symbolic of spiritual completeness. It's uh, symbolic a number of times of God's hand at work. Verse 11. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. In other words, make me whole again. Verse 12. Are not Abana and Phaphar rivers of Damascus better than the, all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went his way in a rage. In other words, he, he doesn't understand what the symbology is. He thinks he's just going to be a literal washing. Verse 13. And the servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father... If the prophet hath bid thee to do some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Verse 14. Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, Elisha, in other words. And his flesh came again, like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. In other words, you, you know what the flesh of a little child is like. You know, how, how uh, clean and, um, you know, the hairs haven't grown out yet and it hasn't withered or aged. So he had fresh new skin. Verse 15. And he returned to the man of God and all his company and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold now, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. Verse 16. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And urged him to take it, but he refused. In other words, Elisha did not want anything for it. In other words, God had healed him. Why should Elijah be paid for that? Verse 17. And Naaman said, Shall not there then, I pray thee, be given unto thy servant two mules of burden of earth? For thy servant will henceforth offer neither burnt offerings nor sacrifice unto other gods, but unto the Lord. In other words, this man has been converted. And again, lowercase g on the gods there. Verse 18. In this thing, the Lord pardon thy servant, when... Uh, that when my master goeth into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leaneth on my hand, and I bow myself of Rimon, that I will bow down myself in the house of Rimon, the Lord pardon thy servant this thing. Verse 19. 
And he said unto him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. Um, this Rimmon is uh, 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 yet another of the uh, gods. And he's probably got to do this, Naaman does, uh, in front of his king. In other words, he's got to go in there. But even though he's going to go in there and act like he's worshipping this, he's actually going to be worshipping the Lord God, which is why he said, The Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. In other words, if he didn't go in there, he would probably be killed. The king would probably kill him for not going in there and worshipping. Verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master, has spared Naaman, the, this Syrian, in not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him and take somewhat of him. In other words, uh, Gehazi here, uh, even though Elijah or Elisha doesn't want to be paid, he, he wants a little something out of the deal. He thinks they deserve something for this. And this is, uh, this is kind of a symbology here of um, a good man gone wrong. Because if God has given a thing, you don't charge for it. In other words, if people want to, as far as today, if people want to make tithe to you, or they want to buy your studies... And my studies no one has to buy because I don't sell them. But uh, if they want to buy them, uh, that's one thing. Or if they want to make a love offering, so to, to feed the poor or for whatever. Or again, the tithe, 10%, to uh, further the church, to further the word of God, that's one thing. But if God gives you something and it's freely given then you don't go out charging for it, and Gehazi doesn't see this, and because of that, he's, he's going to learn a valuable lesson. So Gehazi followed after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from his chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? In other words, is everything okay? Verse 22. And he said, All is well, my master. Or, or all is well. My master has sent me, saying, Behold, even now there come from Mount Ephraim, two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Verse 23. Now, this is a lie. And Naaman said, Be content. Take two talents. And he urged him. And he bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and laid them upon his uh, servants. And they bear them before him. Verse 24. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the man go, and they departed. In other words, Naaman's gone on back to Syria. Verse 25. And he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence cometh thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. In other words, I haven't been anywhere. Verse 26. In other words, he's lied to Elijah, verse 26. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money or to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? In other words, in the frame of a question, verse 27. The leprosy therefore of laymen shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from the presence, a leper as white as snow. And again, you're going to have those of certain groups that say, Oh, he turned him into a Caucasian white man. Thus proving he's evil. You know, and, and, and I get this all the time on the Lost Tribes of Israel video, but that's not what this means. White as snow means exactly what it means. Uh, in cases of leprosy, you don't turn white like a Caucasian. You turn white, meaning you have no pigment. You, you look almost as a cadaver does that's bloodless. Kind of a grayish-white color. A lot of people don't get that and try to use 
verses with these little sayings in them try to, try to further the cause of a particular doctrine. But we won't go into that any further. Second Kings. There we go again with Kings. Must be, must be uh, time for the clock to chime or something. I don't know. Second Kings chapter six and verse one. And the sons of the prophet said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where dwelled the son, or well dwelled, wherewith thee is too straight for us. In other words, behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Verse 2. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make a place there that we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And in other words, it, the place is too straight for us. It's too, uh, usually straight would mean um, too steep, I think, but. Uh, Probably they're a little bit intimidated by the power that Elijah has and uh, probably what they're saying is we're not worthy to dwell here with you. Verse 3. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go thy way, or go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. Verse 4. And he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. Verse 6. But as one of as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. In other words, an axe now is something you can go down to any hardware store and buy, but when you borrowed an axe in the old days, you better return it in uh, the same shape it was in, uh, probably even sharpened up and, and all nice and clean and shiny, because... Uh, when you borrowed something in this time, it was a lot more, uh, there was a lot more laid to you in, in borrowing. In other words, you could be put into servitude for borrowing something and not bringing it back or uh, borrowing something and losing it uh, unless you uh, added to it according to the laws of God uh, threefold or fourfold or, or whatever, what was required for the, for the item borrowed. Verse 6. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. In other words, the iron floated to the surface. Now, we all know that iron doesn't float on water, especially not an axe hand. But then again, this is Elijah causing this to happen, and he had parted Jordan. So it's no marvel that he could cause iron to flow with the hand of God upon him. Verse 7. For said he, Take it up to thee, and put it on his hand, and he took it. Verse 8. Then the king of Syria warred against Israel, and took counsel of his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. Verse 9. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. Verse 10. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. Verse 11. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled with this thing. Uh, basically the, the king of Syria was going to sit there in this place and lie in wait for the king of Israel. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? In other words, he thinks he's got a spy amongst him that has went and told. Verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha the prophet that is in Israel telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy, in thy bedchamber. In other words, only a prophet of God could do this. Verse 13. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. And this, of course, is in the very northernmost part of Samaria, Israel. Uh, not that far away from Syria, as a matter of fact. Verse 14. Therefore he sent thither horses and chariots, 
and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. Verse 15. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early on gone out forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both him with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, master, how shall we do? In other words, what are we going to do? And you notice they came by night. Remember how Christ was taken by night? Only this Elijah, or Elisha, will not be taken because he was not Christ. And it was God's plan that Christ be taken. But it's not God's plan that Elisha be taken. Verse 16. And he answered, in other words, Elisha answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more that be than be with them. In other words, who he's talking about here, Elisha, is the host of heaven. He's talking about the host of God, God and the angels. In other words, for, for all this armor bearer, this person of Elijah knows, it's just him, and I keep saying Elijah, I mean Elisha. For all he knows, it's him and Elisha by themselves. Just them two against all these uh, Syrians. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed. What a wise man. And said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots round about Elisha. Now, these were not the chariots of men, nor the horses of men. These were God's own. In other words, he, God parted the veil so he could see into the spiritual realm what was round about him. In other words, they had more protection than they could possibly ever need. Had there been only one single chariot, they would have had more protection than they ever needed. Verse 18. And when they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word Elisha. Verse 19. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom ye seek. But he led them to Samaria. Verse 20. And it came to pass, when they were come to Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men, that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. In other words, they're in the midst of their freaking enemies. So you, you've got on one case, you've got a man's eyes open to see the spiritual realm. And on the other case, you've got the eyes closed so that they can't see. And this, in essence, was the ability of Christ. On the earth, he opened the eyes of men to see, literally, so that they could see. In other words, he healed the blind so that they could see. That was a literal. But he also gives men eyes to see and ears to hear the spiritual. So you get a type even in this Elijah, or Elisha, I keep saying Elijah, uh, 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 of Christ. He's healed. He's raised from the dead. He has made the waters clean. He has healed from the poison of the vine, which is what Christ would do. And when I say healed from the poison of the vine, I mean the doctrine of Christ, the true doctrine, overcomes the doctrine of the scribes and the Pharisees. This is why Christ would say, Beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. Verse 21. And the king of Israel said to Elijah when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Verse 22. And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those who am taken, who has taken captive thy sword, or with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. Verse 23. What was put before them? Bread and water. What's the bread of life, and what's the living water? That you, if you drink of, you'll never thirst again. Verse 23. And he prepared great provision for them, and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. 
verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered his host and went up to besiege Samaria. Verse 25. And there was great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of a dove dung for five pieces of silver. In other words, they're so hungry, I mean, what is there on a head to eat? You know, it, mostly it's bone. All there is inside is brain, maybe some jowls, some cheek, and uh, a little bit of meat, and uh, doves dung for five pieces of silver. In other words, that's how hungry they were. Verse 26, And as the king of Israel was passing upon the wall, then cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, O Lord, or help my lord, O king. Verse 27, And he said, If the Lord doth not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of, barn, out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? Verse 28, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, this woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Verse 29. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she did hide her son. In other words, imagine how bad it is when you've got to eat your own children. But then again, what was the promise of Moses and the warning to Josh, uh, of Joshua would happen to Israel if they ceased to follow the Lord their God? That they would eat their own children. Imagine what kind of hunger it must take to have to eat your own children. I mean, I don't think I could ever be that hungry. There are people that have gone on hunger strikes and starved themselves totally to death. And, and uh, you know, most people with, with any conscience about them would rather do that than eat their own children. But nevertheless, these things are written. Verse 30. <coughs> Excuse me. And it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes. And he passed by the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Verse 31. Then he said, Go and do, uh, God do so, and more also unto me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. In other words, he, he's wanting to kill Elisha. Verse 32. But Elisha sat in his house, and the elders that sat with him, and the king sent a man before him. But ere the messenger that came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? Verse 33, and his master, of course, is the king. And while he yet talked with him, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? And you know, y you've got so much in that one verse right there. Uh, what did Christ say about if a man is set over a house... But the Lord tarries and the man starts drunken or starts being drunken and starts to smite his fellow servant. You've got a lot of types in these books that um, j just bring so much of the truth forth. Again, it's, it's like God's own voice speaking to you. Verse 7. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time ye shall measure a fine flour for a solid or to be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gates of Samaria. In other words, there, there's going to be food. Verse 2. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, 
Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not eat thereof. Verse 3. And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Verse 4. If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city. If we shall die there, and if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come, let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. In other words, it's better than sitting here doing nothing and starving to death. Verse 5. And they rose up at twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And they were, when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Verse 6. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us, and the kings of the Hittites, and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. And of course, this is having to do with those Syrians that uh, had come against Elijah. And uh, they've moved on off. And uh, after they were fed, they, they moved on off. Verse 7. Wherefore they rose and fled at twilight, and their tents, and their horses, and their asses, even the camp, as it was, fled for their life. Verse 8. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent, and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent, and carried thence also there and hid it. Verse 9. And they said one to another, We do not well this day is a day of good tidings. And we hold our peace. If we tarry here till morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. In other words, <clears throat> they have been taking stuff and hiding it for themselves, but they know if they're found out, some mischief is going to come upon them. So they figure they better go and tell the king before they're found out. Verse 10. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrians, and behold, there was no man there. Neither was there the voice of any man, but the horses tied, and the asses tied, and the tents as they were. Verse 11. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. Verse 12. And the king arose in the night, and said unto his servants, I will now show you that the Syrians have done, or what the Syrians have done to us. They know we be hungry, therefore they are gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. In other words, he thinks this is a deception. Verse 13. And one of his servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of horses that remain, five of the horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are all, as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. Let us send and see. In other words, let's send a few out instead of everybody going out and see what happens. Verse 14. They took therefore two chariot horses and the king sent after the host of the Syrians, saying, Go and see. Verse 15. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in haste, and the messengers returned and told the king. Verse 16. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians, so the measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Verse 17. And the king appointed the Lord, in whose hand leaned on the, uh, to cha leaned to have the charge of the gate, 
And the people trod upon him at the gate, and he died as the man of God had said. In other words, he would not eat of the bread as, as Elisha had told him. When the king came down to him, Okay, I missed a part of that sentence. And he died, as the man of God said, who spake with the king uh, when the king came down to him. So, in other words, this was the this was this was the naysayer, the one that Elijah said, "You're not going to eat of the bread. Uh, tomorrow there will be bread, and it shall be sold for a shekel, but you won't eat of it." Verse nineteen. And it came to pass that the man of God. W- it came to pass, as the man of God had spoken to the king, saying, Two measures of barley for a shekel, and two measures of flour for a shekel, shall be tomorrow, about this time, in the gate of Samaria. Verse 19. And the Lord answered the man of God, and said, Now behold, if the Lord should make windows in heaven, might such a thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but there shall not eat thereof. In other words, this is reiterating what the man said, so you'll know who was being spoken of. Verse 20. So it fell out of him that the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. In other words, he got to see the bread, but he didn't get to partake of it. And uh, you've got an example even there of Christians who have heard of Christ and who have heard of the bread, the living bread, the bread that was broken for them, but don't partake of it. And they're trodden over by the people because of false doctrine, false religion. Second Kings chapter 8 and verse 1. Then Elisha spake unto the woman whose son had been restored to life, saying, Arise, and go thou and thine household, and sojourn wherever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall come upon the land seven years. Verse 2, And the woman arose, and did after the saying of the man of God. And she went with her household, and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. Verse 3, And it came to pass at the seven years end, that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth, to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. Verse 4. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the things that Elisha hath done. Verse 5. And it came to pass when he was telling the king how he had restored the dead body to life. And behold, the woman whose son had been restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land, that Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha restored to life. Verse 6. And when the king asked the woman, she told him, So the king appointed her a certain officer, saying, Restore all that was hers, and all the fruits of the field since the day that she left the land even until now. Verse 7. And Elisha came to Damascus, and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And it was told him, saying, The man of God has come hither. Verse 8. And the king said unto Hazael, Take a present in thine hand, and go and meet the man of God, and inquire of the Lord by him, saying, Shall I recover from this disease? Verse 9. So Hazael went to meet him, and took a present with him, even of every good thing of Damascus, forty camels of burden, and came and stood before him, and said, Thy son, Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, has sent me to thee, saying, Shall I recover of this disease? Verse 10. And Elisha said, Go unto him, thou mayest certainly recover. Or go and say unto him, Thou mayest certainly recover. Howbeit the Lord hath showed me that he shall surely die. In other words, he's going to recover, but he's still going to die. Verse 11. And he settled his countenance steadfastly until he was ashamed, and the man of God wept. Verse 12. And Haziel said, Why weepeth my Lord? Or why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that that will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds will thus set on fire. 
Their young men will thou slay with the sword, and will dash their children and rip up some of their women with child. Verse 13, And Hazael said, But what is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord hath showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. Verse 14, So he departed from Elisha and came to his master, who said unto him, What said Elisha unto thee? And he answered, He told me that thou shalt surely recover. Verse 15, And it came to pass on the morrow, he took a thick cloth and dipped it in water, and spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael reigned in his stead. In other words, he murdered him. Verse 16. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being the king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. Verse 17. Thirty and two years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned eight years in Jerusalem. Verse 18. And he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahab, and the daughter of Ahab was his wife. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 19. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for David his servant's sake, as he promised to give him always a light. In other words, and to his children. In other words, he promised him his posterity. Verse 20. In his days, Edom revolted under the hand of Judah and made a king over themselves. Verse 21. So Joram went over to Zaire and all the chariots with him. And he rose by night and smote the Edomites, which compassed him about, and the captains of the chariots, and the people fled to their tents. Yet Edom revolted, verse 22, Yet Edom revolted under the hand of Judah unto this day, and Libnah revolted at the same time. Verse 23, And the rest of the acts of Joram, and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? Verse 24, And Joram slept with his fathers, and was buried in his father's city of David, or in the city of David, and Ahaziah, his son reigned in his stead. As you might have noticed, some of these are not quite in chronological order because we've already heard of Ahaziah. Uh, in other words, these are recapping what has been. Verse 25. And then the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, did Isaiah, the son of Jor- Jor- Jehoram, the king of Judah, begin to reign. Verse 26. Twenty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Athaliah, the daughter of Omri, the king of Israel. Verse 27. And he walked in the way of the house of Ahab, and did evil in the sight of the Lord, as did the house of Ahab, and he was the son-in-law of the house of Ahab. Verse 28. And he went with Joram, the son of Ahab, to war against Haziel, the king of Syria, in Ramoth-Gilead. And the Syrians wounded Joram. Verse 29. And the king Joram went back to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds which the Syrians had given him at Ramah, when he fought against Haziel, the king of Syria. And Ahiza, the son of Jehoram, king of Judah, went down to see Joram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel because he was sick. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna leave it here for this particular lecture, and uh, we'll pick it up in the next lecture with uh, the ninth chapter. But uh, I hope you are seeing these spiritual types, which are being put before you. I mean, there also you're being read chronologies of, of, of the order in which things are so that you can keep track of these seed lines. That's the whole reason these are here, so that you'll be able to trace the seed lines but, um, and, and know the events of the times, of course. But um, as always, my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is my prayer for you that you will dig into your Father's Word that you will take it and eat thereof, that you may not hunger, 
or be in starvation or famine or in pestilence from deception or for the from the cunning words of men even if they do stand and preach at the pulpit but rather that you will gird yourself in the gospel armor of God that which is to say the truth that you will anoint yourself in the truth and that you will take the time to study to show yourself approved this is the only way you can prove these things to yourself and always always ask our Father for the gift of wisdom and knowledge and understanding always pray to our Father to reveal things to you that you may understand as you study this his most holy word may God bless you in all your studies those of you that care to hearken unto the voice of our Father and may he wake the rest who are too blind to see what they're missing out on thank you for listening this has been Just Thoughts